Having said that Sabbath has now become the Lord's Day doesn't mean we can sort of let it go, right? Or do what we please on those days. We don't have to not remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy after all. It's a commandment. It's a big one. It's number three. So it meant it still is important, right? The difference is this. We get to keep the Sabbath because Jesus changes it from a day of obligation to a day of rest in Him. Okay? From a holy day to observe to a day that changes every day forever. Open to Matthew 11, 28. We, the last part of 11 and the first part of 12. We heard this last Sunday, and it's sort of the center of what Jesus is teaching in these two chapters. 11, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you are, who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain for him and to eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Well, haven't you read what David did? When he and his companions were hungry, he entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple desecrate the day and yet are innocent? I tell you, one greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would have condemned. You would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. The Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. Many followed him, and he healed all their sick warning them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill. It was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him. He will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out until he leads justice to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. That's the longest quotation of Isaiah in the Gospel of Matthew. So it must have meant something, right? They would have known what Jesus was talking about as he started to quote Isaiah 42 to them. In our walk through the Gospel of Matthew, we've just heard a number of voices as we walk through giving witness to who Jesus was and his mission. John the Baptist opens Jesus' career, if you will, by saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then God follows with, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The thundering voice from heaven. We start to get an idea of who Jesus is, right? His validation continues as you page through Matthew, as he lets demons even identify him, as they slither questions such as, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? They knew who he was. See, if you know anything about Jesus' life and message, you'll agree that Jesus speaks through these testimonies of the people that he heals, displaying their trust in the power of God to transform life and to change us, to change the world for the better. But in today's lesson, it's almost a little anticlimactic, isn't it? I mean, you think he would build it up to something fantastic, but he does this little tiny thing in the synagogue that day. He heals someone's hand. He doesn't bring a dead girl back to life and give her back to her parents, right? Or restore sight to a blind man or heal a paralytic and have him run off and talk about Jesus, the healing man from Galilee. Now he, he heals a hand. Yeah, it's okay. It's not very dramatic. He makes one hand as good as the other, but he does it on the Sabbath. And he does it in front of his enemies, right under their noses, after they challenge him. Kind of like, watch this. To be, to be clear, he commits a capital offense. He's working on the Sabbath. 
capital offense for which the penalty was death. And they're out to look for these kinds of things that they can record them and bring their case back to the temple, to the Sadducees, and say, here he is. Here's the rebel from Nazareth. We got him on this. So what's, what's your verdict? We know what happened, right? I mean, his enemies had this suspicion all along that he was really just nothing more than a wild man with maybe some healing power, claiming to be God, running around with Gentiles and sinners. But it's exactly how Jesus planned it, that he would get in trouble with them and that they would take notice. He heals the man's hand to make a point, if only just to make a point. I'm sure he appreciated the healing, but he was really as an illustration that day. And his point is this. God didn't make the rules to play some twisted game of gotcha. God didn't make rules to see which ones we would break so he could nail us. God made the rules because we're already broken. The world is already broken. Is it not shattered? And no one knows better than God how to put us back together. God knows how we will break ourselves against his unbreakable law and how we will need to be restored. Which is why he sends Jesus to break us free from the bondage to sin and death. So Jesus comes to put on display just how broken the rule makers were, those Pharisees in the temple and the synagogue. Not just the rule makers, but the rules themselves got twisted and flipped so that the little ones became more important than the big ones. The commands with love at their basis had somehow lost significance to these little tiny kind of regulations that had a purpose, but they weren't the main thing. So the rules which kept people from a right understanding of God, those little rules, those regulations, they had to go because they were in the way. They had to be put in their right place after the law of love was fully established and understood before it. And it had been reversed when Jesus comes, by when Jesus arrives on planet Earth. You see, Jesus, by keeping every command the Father had given him, was testing every rule made by humans and showing them what was most important. He never once disobeyed the Father's commands. There's a difference between a rule and a command and a regulation. While those who accused him of committing capital crimes for which the sentence was death sort of missed his point altogether, making Jesus' point even more clearly. Although Jesus was innocent, he accepts the sentence of those who called him guilty. See that? They were guilty of the very crimes that they accused Jesus of committing. Even though Jesus' enemies broke the law on a regular basis, they got off on technicalities. Well, they're priests. They can do that. Well, he was King David. He had to eat because he was hungry. He was King David. <coughs> See, it made God look like a cosmic killjoy. These 613 laws based on the town that were clearly established. It made God look like a cruel landlord when all God wanted to do was to be regarded as he was, truly the Lord of life. And it comes down to that one sentence in Matthew 12, 14. The Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Now we know the rest of the story. And if we read that as Christians, we can say, thank God. Even though this is our hero, this is Jesus. But if Jesus doesn't get killed, we don't get saved. We know that. But I wonder if their meeting took place on the Sabbath. You wonder about that? Which would have been considered work, a meeting, right? Which would have made it illegal. And Jesus could have accused them of having an illegal meeting. Well, it doesn't matter, does it? The point is, it took place, and they did it. And their plan to kill Jesus was really God's plan all along? To save you, to save us. They just did know they were doing God's work. So Jesus is going to be charged with this capital crime of working on the Sabbath, healing this, this, hand, this man's hand. Now, wouldn't you think it could have waited another day? I mean, it's just a hand, right? I mean, he wasn't dying or anything. I mean, could have waited until the next day. I mean, isn't that the kind of attitude you expect from folks who accuse Jesus' disciples of breaking bread, of breaking the law by rubbing some grain in their palms to get a little food to eat on the Sabbath? Because they were hungry. So it wasn't against the law. 
Interesting how little is said about that meeting. Chapter 12, verse 14. But it's everything. It leads to his crucifixion and death, which leads to his resurrection, which leads to new life, and his return for us. That little verse, chapter 12, 14, underline that. It's the key to your life, abundant and life eternal. Because they would put Jesus to death, a humiliating, public, and painful death, to try to teach him a lesson, to send a message to his disciples and all those who've been following Jesus around, that this was over. But what happened? Everything else had exploded, right? It did the very opposite they expected. It caused people to ask questions about what is right and who is God. So Jesus came because his mission was not to sort of work with the holy things in the temple and the synagogue and the regulations and the food laws. And you know those if you read your Old Testament. His deal was to work with people. People were holy to Jesus. Relationships were holy and sacred. He is Lord of the Sabbath because he puts things in their right place and restores people to their right place before God. In a loving, dynamic, caring, and gentle relationship with the Savior, who will not so much as snuff out a candle that's almost out already, who won't even break off a reed, which is just like a, a weed, not even a twig. He won't break it off even though it's bent because it might be able to be restored. Maybe that's you. Maybe your light is just about out. Maybe you're kind of bruised and you're thinking, well, this is it. There's not much left. Why restore it? See, that's not God's plan. That's why this passage from Isaiah says he won't break it off. He will restore it. He will bring light to it. He will bring it to life again. Because God is patient. And God is loving. And God is gentle. And it was God's plan to show Jesus as the one who suffered for our sake. Who endured anything and everything from the ugliest to the bitterest. From the sad to the scared. To the confused. Even though the plans of Jesus' enemies were to think that if they just told this lie enough times, eventually people would believe it. And they tried it didn't work, did it? The truth prevailed because Jesus told the truth. You shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that, that comes from the mouth of God. See, it's not whether you come to church or not on Sunday. Or not. Or don't come to church on Sunday. It's whether you know the Lord of the Sabbath or not. Because if you know the Lord of the Sabbath, who is Jesus, there is no place you'd rather be than in God's house on the Sabbath, on the Lord's Day or Sunday the day our Lord Himself was raised from the dead. See, Sunday really never was our day in the first place. We just think it was. Here it is. The Lord's Day is the final warning to the enemies of God that those who imagined killing Jesus would kill this story once and for all when it was really just the beginning. So here's a word for you today. Last Sunday, Pastor Dave told me to rest, to come to him. This Sunday, I'm telling you not to go to church. Don't go to church to go to church. Get it? Because this isn't church. I mean, yeah, it's gathering and we're here to gather. It's a good thing. I hope you come back next week. But don't come here just to come. Okay? Or don't not do X or Y or Z on Sunday just to not do it to keep the Sabbath holy. You see, when folks who go to church just to go to church, they don't get what they come for or what they do. <coughs> kind of like folks who never go to church to avoid God. They don't get it either, because they never come. And this is church, your church, is what I'm saying. Church is tomorrow morning as well. Even though sanctuary will be empty, it'll still be church, because it'll be out there. That's where church is. It's daily, right? I mean, you could have years of going to church just to go in your history, or decades of not going just to avoid God, but you're never going to get what God wants to give you, what you need most, a dynamic, vital and living and daily relationship with the Lord of the Sabbath. The Lord of Monday and the Lord of Tuesday and the Lord of Wednesday and Thursday and even Friday and night Saturday every day. Because sometimes the truth is hidden in the promise the dimly burning candle will eventually go out if it is never tended. That bruised reed will eventually break as it is battered by the wind so come back to the source. Be renewed. Be restored. Because this church, his church, 
would like nothing better than to provide you with evidence of why you need to come back and why you need to live this daily. And there's a lot of people here this morning that can tell you about that if you don't know about it, and I'd like to introduce you to each other. Because the Lord of the Sabbath wants to be the Lord of your life. There's a difference. Your Monday morning quarterback, your all-day agenda on Tuesday, your teacher on Wednesday, your doctor on Thursday, your companion on Friday, your friend on Saturday, your champion on Sunday. That's the Lord of the Sabbath. He wants to be the Lord of your life. So this Lord's Day is not a day that God can use to sort of toss a wet blanket over the other six days of your life, right, and get, a, get you back to even, or to take you on a guilt trip and say, boy, you're really I'm glad you're here, because boy, you really messed up the last six days or the last 12, whatever number it is. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath because he has come to conquer things that try to conquer you and break you. He's come to invite you to rest, to have rest for your soul, the yoke that is easy, the burden that is light because it's already been lifted for you. He's already done all the only lifting that he can do and you can't, the burden of sin and death. And I can prove it because I've got a church to introduce you to. See, Jesus gave a blind man his sight back that day and returned the gift of speech to those who couldn't speak but he healed the hand of that one who one hand worked and one didn't. And I think he did it to put him back to work. Because he needed to do what God had created him to do. To put bread on his table. To live out his life in light of the Lord of the Sabbath. On Monday, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and the rest of the week. And the reason Jesus can demand such is to show mercy is because he's already shown sacrifice. That's the difference. The reason Jesus can require us to obey God's law is because he's already demonstrated God's love. And the reason Jesus heals is not so that we might try to prove who God is by responding, but to prove what he has already done. Let's pray. God, you have come, you have healed, you have demonstrated, you have witnessed. And so now make us the followers. Monday through Saturday, through Sunday. Every day of the week is your day. You are the Lord of the Sabbath. Let you let us be, let you be the Lord of our lives. That we may serve you and love you and follow you. Until you return. In Jesus' name.